Bum, ba, da, bum, ba, ba, da, bum. And hopefully this is now working. I all right, and we are live. I changed a few settings, so uh, I was a little nervous about it because sometimes these things you change the one little thing and the whole thing just gets whacked. You know? <laughs> and then you're like, oh crap, I need to turn this. Oh, I gotta fix this. Eh, 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 fix this. Mm, oh, try typing this in. Oh, that ain't it. What's it? Or maybe I need to unplug, reboot. You know, it's just, it's, and if you have somebody else as your backup, if you have somebody else as your backup who can handle these things, so like for the Scotch Four Dummies, uh, uh, Drew handles a lot of their technical stuff, um, but you tend to get really, really, really stressful uh, when things aren't going right. So we're actually starting a few minutes early. Perhaps some people are taking a quick, getting a bite. So um, I will ease into this. I'll not really, really, really start for another four minutes, but I'm glad everything is working. Thank you all for uh, tuning back in. If you're watching this on the replay, uh, we just had a premiere in which I covered uh, the top uh, five. I went over the top five uh, bourbons for Bourbon Month 2019. And I did a summary of the 20 bourbons uh, that I reviewed. Also talked about uh, some that I thought was a disappointment. You know, the one thing I forgot to do, there were actually some things I forgot to do in that video. I would mentioned I was going to do it at the beginning, but I forgot to do it. I forgot to talk about the runners up or our honorable mentions, that kind of a thing. I just forgot to do that. Um, if I was doing a top 10, they would have been in it. But I didn't do a top 10 because I only reviewed 20 bourbons and a top 10 would be half. Right? Okay, so one of the bourbons that you were probably expecting to, to, to make the top five would have been this one, uh, the Redemption High Rye. And I just really went back and forth. I almost made this number five. I was back and forth between uh, the Maker's Mark, Private Select. It, it could have gone either way. I really, really like this one, but I also don't have a ton of experience with rye. Um, so this to me stood out one as a very strong rye, one I really, really liked, but it wasn't quite there. Hey, Donna Pass says, hi, good topic after your uh, month of bourbon. My uh, votes are for scotch and I started with bourbon. Oh, that's cool. So, yeah, so we're going to get into a little bit about the scotch versus bourbon uh, as, a, as a topic. Um, so that would have been one of my honorable mentions, and I don't want to knock this over. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Another one would have been uh, pretty, really close was actually the Ocean, the Jefferson's Ocean. Um, again, another finished bourbon, um, but I really, really like that. So that would have been an honorable mention. That would have put close to the top 20. For me, that the, the, what I like that bourbon for is for blending. Um, by itself, it's good. I have been taking that bourbon and to try another, you know, have another bourbon and just put in a little bit and it adds uh, you know, some character. It adds another layer of complexity. It's like spicing your food or something like that. Um, <coughs> it, so that's the way I would use that one. So there are a lot of foods that you don't necessarily eat st straight by themselves. Like I don't sit around eating mushrooms. I love mushrooms, but I don't sit around eating mushrooms. But and, and black, I don't eat black olives. I don't sit around eating black olives, but I love putting them on other things, particularly uh, pizza. Two more minutes till we officially start. This is my uh, technical preview to make sure everything is uh, working. So one of the things that you may notice here uh, is this rack uh, that I've got displayed here. Oh, and in fact, I meant to bring a catalog. Uh, it's put away. So this is a rack for challenge coins. If you guys are um, collecting challenge coins, there is actually a catalog called Sergeant Grit. Sergeant Grit. It's a Marine Corps paraphernalia catalog. They sell hats and T-shirts and, uh, I mean, just anything you can think of. Anything with a, with a uh, uh, lock that says, nice rack. Thank you. Don't mind if I do. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, anyway, they sell all kinds of stuff. I, so, I have a bunch of coins for my term, time in the Marine Corps and other services. Uh, and so I have one of these for that. So I got another one for my challenge coins. I wish the coins sort of locked in there. 
they could easily get knocked over. But basically, the idea is you could put your your coins on your desk. Most people in the military, you know, they have an office maybe, and they they put them up up here or something like that. And that's what I'm doing with uh, this as well. This goes for about fifty-four dollars. It has a dark stain. I would guess it's pine. I don't know what kind of what it is. Um, so you can see some of my coins. Eventually, this will get filled out some more down here. Actually, uh, uh, no nonsense whiskey. Vin has mailed me one. It should arrive probably any day. So you may notice a few down here. So this is uh, my bourbon journey. Uh, Twenty and C. I'm looking at the screen. Aqua Vitae's, the whiskey dick. Uh, Scotch test dummies here, Scotch four dummies uh, are over here. Uh, I've got a coin, my coin's over here. This is the Whiskey Tribe coin. I should, where's my coin? Um, da, 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 da. I should put mine much more prominent down here in front. Anyway, down here in front, here we go. Here's my coin. I have 51 coins left and I just mailed a bunch of them. So if you, I, I don't mind giving away whiskeys. It's the hassle of packaging and going to the post office. That's the part I'm not real big on. Same thing with the coins. I don't mind selling the coins and stuff. It's just a hassle. To, anyway, so if you guys want one, send me an email to at ericwade at yahoo.com. I've got 50 of them left. I'm taking some with me to Texas. I'm gonna take some with me to London and Scotland. Some will probably uh, go at then, so I'm going to save on t for some uh, for those trips. But anyway, alrighty. So, in case you guys want to know what is in my glass, and we are now at the official starting time, in case somebody's tuning in uh, at the scheduled time. So, I have two whiskeys here that I find they don't they don't taste similar per se, uh, but they would fit within a similar aroma and flavor profile and let me explain that in, in, in for a minute uh, a minute so if you were to categorize whiskeys and very early in my journey i started categorizing whiskeys some are earthy some are fruity some have some sweetness to them you know obviously the, the smoky and the peaty ones so you can kind of think about these categories of, of whiskeys in terms of flavor profiles but if you were to put whiskeys in the profile of savory so it's got a barbecue character to a barbecue meat, a lot of spice, perhaps a little bit of saltiness. Then this category for bourbons, excuse me, for whiskeys fits both this one. This is the Balakan Highland Single Malt Scotch Whiskey, 12-year-old uh, burgundy cast finish, heavily peated. And Amy's in the house. I believe uh, her and her husband, uh, George, that they have a bottle of this. I have two bottles of this. I first got a sample of this from Scotch Four Dummies when I visited them. It, the sample they gave me, just the sample, made my top 10 for 2018 because it was absolutely fantastic. Fell in love with it so much, I ordered two bottles and then Mark from Scotch Four Dummies got it for me and then sent it to me. So it, this has those savory, meaty, barbecue characteristics to it. Of course, it's peated, so it's also got some smoke. And of course, the Magnus. My number one bourbon from Bourbon Month for 2019. And it is a contender, for, I won't know until the end of the year, to be in my top 10 for 2019. But I have a whole trip uh, of Scotland to go to. I have a trip to Texas to go to. So uh, it's still early in the year. So we can't exactly uh, call that j just yet. But um, if you go side by side with these two coins, uh, excuse me, with these two bourbons, Ooh, in my right hand is the Joseph Magnus, bottled at 50% ABV, 100 proof. The Balekin is at, it's it's up there, 57.5% uh, alcohol by volume. So they're in that $50 to $60 range, so it's similar. Um, the Whiskey Dying asked him if I'm going to be at the, Whis at the Isla Festival. No, so the official is in May. I won't be there until July. One of these days, you know, one of these years, I might get out there. So I land in actually in London on July 4th. I'll be in London for two days, meet up with Jason Whiskey Wise and probably some others. And then I actually land in, in Glasgow July 6th, which is actually be my 53rd birthday. I spent two weeks in Scotland. Most of the, my main tent for being there 
in addition to visiting distilleries, is I'm, I'm taking a class with the uh, Edinburgh Whiskey Academy. In fact, I have homework that I'm currently working on, and I'll talk about that towards the end of this video, because I'll probably do some videos related to that. Anyway, so my trip's basically around that. So both of these are showing the fruit, but there is that barbecue, savory, salty, and there's actually, because the Joseph Magnus is finished in Pedro Jimenez and Oloroso Sherry Cask, if you're not familiar with Sherry's, Sherry's have that salty character to them. Uh, and so that has carried over into the Joseph uh, Magnus. So what I think probably really excites me is, yes, a sweet whiskey is fine. An earthy whiskey or it's fine. A smoky whiskey is fine. But when you can combine sweet, savory, and a little saltiness, that just rings my bell. The other whiskey that's like this, which was my number one whiskey for uh, 2018, was the Bunohaven um, Moin Oloroso, the Fish Ill Edition. They have other Moin Oloroso. Moin is uh, Gaelic, just means peated uh, or heavily peated. So if you can get a Bunohaven Moin, uh, you're probably hitting this, this same sort of camp. Another whiskey that touches on that is right back here, the Lefroy 10 Cask Strength. Not the regular 10, but the Cask Strength. The Cask Strength, the Lefroy 10 Cask Strength and the Lefroy Regular 10 are like two different animals. This also has some of that savory uh, note to it that I really, really, really like. Now, oh, Amy says they got two of these as well. So the only place you can get these, because it's a store-specific uh, uh, purchase, uh, is from the... Um, <coughs> wine and table in indianapolis it's on and they don't ship so uh mark had to get it for him all righty so let's talk about our topic a little bit but first let's take a little sip because that's what we do mm. i need some water hold on one second i need some water Sorry, I was drinking water before we started, and then I forgot to refill my glass. Man, that's good. I really, really like that. And some others in the chat have said that if I like this one, that some of the other bottlings are even better. But I really, really like that one. God. I know. I feel like I'm doing like the fourth review of this uh, this bourbon. It's got sweetness, and it's even opened up more now. Because if you see, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting down on it. It's got the sweetness, it's got the savory, it's got the salty, it's got black fruit, it got dried black fruit notes, fig, dates, raisins. It has, have you ever had um, baklava? Baklava, and there's various types of baklava um, under different names. The whole Near East has some sort of version, what are you talking about, Israel or Turkey or, or Greece? Um, it's very, they're all very similar and just slightly different differences. Basically, it's a super thin, multi-layered um, pastry. In between is like, uh, like brown sugar and honey and nuts and you know that kind of that. This sort of has that sort of sweet baklava uh, barbecue. Well, not barbecue, but uh, the brown sugar notes to it right now. Absolutely superb. Mm. And the barbecue notes are coming up more on the back, and the saltiness is coming up on the back. Absolutely love this. All right. So the topic is scotch versus bourbon. Scotch versus bourbon. I just wrote down, so basically, four different categories of pros, of strengths and weaknesses that I think scotch and bourbon have, apparently against each other. Um, we can talk about flavor range. We can talk about prices. We can talk about the overall integrity in terms of laws and what's required of the two different whiskeys. And then we can talk about availability. And that's a whole nother, whole nother uh, 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 issue on, on its own. All right, so scotch versus bourbon. Now I'm gonna take a little bit of sip off the uh, uh, Balekin. If you're not familiar with Balekin, so Edward Dower is the distillery. And anything that they make is peated is called Balekin. Uh, I think it's an ode to a previous 
a distiller that doesn't exist anymore, but I could be wrong in that one. Anyway, take a little drink of water and then we'll go over that one. Um, oh, jeez. I wish we had smell of vision and I could just go like this and here, take a whiff, get it off the mic. Hmm. Hey, George. Wow. George, if you got one of these, pour yourself, pour yourself a dram. I know you I know you have two, two bottles of these. The main thing, so these are both in the, I would put these both in the category of sweet, savory, and salty. The primary difference is, this is going to go over into that smoke, character, smoke area. So this doesn't have the smokiness to it. In fact, I didn't even, I wasn't even thinking about it. it, it dummy me. Once you taste this and once you get the, that peat and it, smoke on it, um, going back to this, that smoke is going to somewhat overshadow this. So the one thing that this doesn't have in terms of general category, flavor profiles, it doesn't have the smoke and the peat. But everything else, you could see they're almost like cousins in, in, in sort, of, sort of a way. All right. Flavor range. Flavor range, bourbon versus scotch. One of the things I think I learned so this air quote whiskey studies. I don't just do reviews. It's always about study. Even though I may be reviewing one and giving point scores and all that sort of nonsense, it's all about learning. In fact, after I get back from Texas, I'm going to be doing some videos. I'm going to do a whole weekend. It's going to be the geekiest. It's a study weekend for me, and I'm sharing with you my study time. And and probably, I imagine people probably won't tune in just because it's just going to be uber geeky. But we'll talk about that later. Hmm. But I need to get in some study time. Doing the reading now, now putting notes together, I'm creating a self quiz. One of the things I do in, in going through all the different certifications, certified my exam, French wine scholar, you know, blah 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 blah, is I create my own exams. And the process of creating the exams or quizzes uh, helps drill it into my head. And then by quizzing myself and going through it, it just it's just a way of ingraining my head. And then I can share it with fellow students. So that's one of the things I do. Um, when it's done, I will upload the document to my uh, Facebook group. I have a Facebook group on on, uh, on Facebook, Eric Waite Whiskey and Wine Studies. I always usually put a link down in the description box down below. So you can join that for free. I upload the documents on there. You can get download it for free. I have a lot of notes and stuff on there. There's a file section on Facebook. And so you can go in there and find other things to down download uh, as well. So I'm going to be posting um, the the. Uh, re required reading before the EWA Ed Edinburgh Whiskey Academy um, uh, course. There's, and I'll put those documents on there. I have my own Scotch um, primer that I'll be posting on there, and then I'll put the self quiz on there. And then I'm actually going to do a video in which I cover this material. Uh, some will be live, some will be pre recorded, but it'll be a whole compacted weekend of just studying like crazy. And this helps me to study. Hey, Hoyt, thank you very much for tuning in. And William uh, Devlar, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. So I'm going to have a heavy, hardcore study weekend, uh, probably the weekend after uh, this weekend. So a weekend after this one. And if you want to learn and you want to study along, that's great. Um, and if you have, anyway, but I'm just going to share with you my studies. So flavor range. Let's talk flavor range. Bourbon versus scotch. Now, Re this is one of the main arguments by Scotch is look look how much variety we have. We the the base ingredients of bourbon versus Scotch obviously is corn versus barley. Um, yeah, they can use a little bit of barley in uh, bourbon too, but they need the enzyme in order to uh, convert um, uh, the starches into into sugar. So they always usually have a little bit of barley in there. They can add an enzyme as well. Anyway, how long are you staying in Texas? I'll be landing Thursday night, and I'll be there till Sunday night. So I'm doing a three-day weekend in, in Texas. Um, so I'm basically just hitting distilleries and shooting video and doing photography. I'd like to stay longer, but i got to come back to work on Monday. Uh, George says, uh, the Balakin is anything like the Joseph Magnus. I may need to get one. Yeah, so it, just picture in your head, this is a, a, an analogy. And analogies break down at some point. But imagine the, the Balakin, but without the smoke. Uh, that's sort of where, where we're going on that one. I think, again, that's an analogy and it breaks down at some point. All right. So, obviously, with uh, you have two different base grains, but 
with scotch, you have, they use bourbon casks, all right? So in some, I've actually had, uh, I actually did have, uh, I've had some scotches that were finished or aged just in bourbon, and you could pick up just a hint of the bourbon influence, depending on how old the oak is and how long they age and so forth. You just get a wee bit of, of core note in there. Then obviously you can have the sherry casks, uh, Pedro Jimenez casks. You can have uh, wine casks, you know, like the uh, Longro, they, Longro Red. They do these uh, red casks. You have the um, Dior from Glen Morangy that's done on a soft turn cask. So generally speaking, Scotch has a bigger menu Bigger spice rack, so to speak. Imagine if you're pulling, you're, you're baking something, you're pulling different things off your shelf to put into the stew. In a sense, Scotch has a bigger menu of things to pull from. Yeah, Hoyt. So I talked about these at the beginning, uh, at, at the beginning of this. Um, so that means there's a lot more, generally speaking, again, these are generalities, a lot more flavors and aromas, a lot more variety with Scotch. I'm going to go back. To the Joseph Magnus, because that's what we do. Hey, Zach Andrews, thank you for, for tuning in. Mm. And, and this is the thing about this one. If you know someone who loves scotch, but they sit, they stick their nose up at bourbon, I would say, mm, try this one. I think this is a scotch lover's bourbon. Um, and if they don't like peat, but they want the characteristics that you get Say in a Glendronic or something like that. Bammo. This is it. It's really, really uh, fantastic. And we'll get the prices later. It's under a hundred bucks. Personally, if I was doing this blind, I would put this at 120. It, it, thinking in the way scotches are priced, I would put this at 120. Easy. Alrighty. Flavor range. Okay. This has always been the the the, the argument of the scotch lovers is is scotch has a lot more flavor range there's a lot more so there's a lot more to choose from there's a lot more variety zach andrew says hi i didn't want to interrupt the stream of, of consciousness uh no worry i'm semi-conscious at the moment so we're, we're good um <laughs> um so what is the counter argument to that well it's not that bourbon is so narrow but there's a sense in what you're talking apples and oranges. Bourbon is a closer to being like a grape varietal in which you're different ways in which you're working with a particular grape varietal. So that there's a lot of variance, but it's going to be depending on the, the differences are, 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 are minor shifts, not major jumps. So scotch... You're going from just bourbon cask to sherry cask. That's a big jump, okay? You're going from bourbon cask to red wine finish. Boom. These are major leaps. The bourbon differences between most classic bourbons is, is nuance. It's slight changes. It's these minor little differences. And there's a sense in which to really get to know your bourbons and you watch the bourbon guys, uh, My Bourbon Journey, uh, watch... Um, the Mash and Drum, watch Blind Bourbon Reviews, watch John over at um, <coughs> Blind Whiskey Reviews. They're, they're, they're little nuances and little tweaks. And by having just minor differences between the qualitative differences and flavor and aroma, aroma differences, it sort of forces you to pay attention, okay, why is that a little bit different? And I find that fascinating. The reason why this bourbon has these traits that this one doesn't have is because of where the whole Rick house is, where that bear was in the Rick house, um, uh, and the charring of the oak. Let's just take that one. Then there's the percentages in the mash bill where they're talking about wheat or rye or barley. And it's those little percentages differences that are making up these little differences it's almost similar to some Scotch differences within the same, same camp where the, the, the differences is the length of the still and the angle of the line arm. It's not a huge jump. 
a huge difference between scotches. You, whether you're talking about the, 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 the small stills of McCollin or the super tall draft skills of, of Glenn Morangy, it's not a major jump. It's more of a matter of a nuance. Chris Beaton, thank you very much for tuning in. And I'm going to take another sip because I'm getting a little bit of parch because that's what we do. In a similar fashion, I think, it's, those, it's the minor differences. It's the matter of nuance. And by having, generally speaking, in terms of classic bourbons, a narrower swath of aromas and flavors, it almost, and by law, limitations as to what they can do, it forces the distillers to get into the nitty gritty, to pay the attention to the, to the minor things, because they're going to, because this it take Jim Beam that's got a, like a gazillion sub brands and bottlings. It's those little differences that they got to pay attention to and they got to pay super uh, uh, tight attention to where things are in, 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 in the Rick house that forces them to come up with something. Because if they didn't, all their stuff would probably end up tasting pretty much the same. And if a Scotch person says bourbons all taste the same, no, it doesn't. Uh, Michael Hassett says, in the military, you could challenge somebody at, yeah, at a bar with a, out a coin. If the other person didn't have one, then the person had to buy you one. And then they had to buy you, hence a challenge coin. By the way, so I was in the Marine Corps, and I saw challenge coins. I saw, in fact, I saw racks similar to this. I never saw anybody challenge anybody, but that's, yeah, that's the story behind it. Um, I'm planning on carrying a couple coins with me down to Texas, and I plan on challenge a few people down there. Um, but, but, but don't want to give them a warning, warning of it. Anyway, so I like the fact that b having a narrower lane, so to speak, sort of forces them to be a little bit more artisan about how they're doing things in order to produce a different profile. And I kind of like that. All right. Then, of course, the response we can also have now with bourbons is, well, yes, we, we have these limitations as what you call, know what to call bourbon, and it's got to be aged in uh, new oak, all right, new charred oak. But it can be finished. Finish it. So the finishing time doesn't count towards the time if they put an age statement on it. Towards the age. So if they did say four years in new oak and then two years, you know, in some other kind of oak, a finishing cask, they would not be able to take those two years and then count that towards the age of the bourbon. The, the class, it's being classified as a bourbon ends when they remove it from that barrel and then the finishing is just something added on different. But we're seeing, I think, some really, really cool things coming up in bourbon. And I'm really looking forward to the mash and drum. And I would love to do a tasting with him on this. I'd like to try more finished bourbons. And he's, uh, he's I brought up the topic and he says he's going to do a video on, on finished bourbons. Because I'm it's it's an area in which I think the bourbon world um, can play around with it more. That they can bring in some differences. My only concern is this. My only concern is this. I'm really big on identity of where you're at and what you're doing. Um, Napa needs to be Napa. Don't try to be like the French. The French have a maritime climate, or oh, Bordeaux. Don't try to be like Bordeaux. Bordeaux has a maritime climate, uh, excuse me, a Mediterranean climate. I'm screwing this up. Bordeaux has a maritime climate. Napa has a Mediterranean climate. They have different soils. Those two big things means they can't be like each other. For the most part, Napa needs to be Napa and Bordeaux needs to be Bordeaux. Don't try to don't try to be like Napa and Napa shouldn't be trying to be like Bordeaux. Now they can get really close depending on the vintage, but you can still tell the difference. Anyway, if this is my opinion, uh, D itself, yes, I got that. Thank you very much. In fact, I mentioned it earlier in the video. You hadn't turned in yet. If the bourbon is has this is my opinion has a finishing on it so that you can't recognize it as a bourbon while it may taste really, really, really good, I think you're losing your soul. I think it's losing its soul. I think whiskeys have a soul. Wines have a soul. If you put Pinot Noir in a very warm region so it comes off super dark and tannic and high alcohol, it loses its soul. Pinot Noir needs specific climates, specific soils to show its best in the same way if you're masking all the classic bourbon traits with a finishing, while it may taste good, and maybe to some people I know that's all they care about, 
I don't. I still want to see the classic bourbon traits in my bourbon. Um, bourbon Satan says, I love that coin holder. I wish I had them for sale. They're about $55 plus tax. You can get them through um, Sergeant Grit. Damn, that's good. Um, Captain Make It Happen says, in that vein, do you have any thoughts on Legend yet? No, I haven't. Um, in fact, I, I do a lot of promotion for the Magic Drum. It's funny. But we're friends, you know. Um, he just reviewed it. In fact, he's already in Colorado. I would have asked him to bring a sample for me. Maybe I'll grab one. Because that's what I'm curious about. Because here you have... Two producers, you have a bourbon, and then you have a Japanese gentleman. Uh, you know, no, and I can't remember the Japanese gentleman's name. The Japanese gentleman did the the um, the blending. One, what I asked in the comment section on Jason's review of Legend is, did, I'm curious if it had any reflection of the Japanese culture and style. And he said no. He said it really, of course, I don't know how much exposure he's had to Japanese whiskeys. Um Whiskey Throttle says, so I have a nine-year-old Heaven Hills that has been finished in ex Lafroy barrel. Wow. But not finished time mentioned. Not finished time mentioned. That sounds interesting. It, it, does it have peatiness or smokiness to it? That would be interesting. Um, I've not had a peated bourbon yet, but I know there are some. Anyway, so what I asked Jason was about the legend is, is there any reflection of anything Japanese in there? So uh, later... This month, I'm going to have a fellow sommelier on. He is in Norway. We're going to do probably do a premiere video, record it, and then I'll, I'll post it as a premiere. But we're going to talk about Japanese whiskeys. His wife is he's, Nor he's Norwegian. He's from Norway. But his wife is Japanese and lived in, uh, in Japan. He's done wine studies, wine reviews, and he's been doing whiskey reviews, and he's done some Japanese. So I think he has a really good insight into the Japanese whiskey world, uh, having that background. Anyway, so... Classic Japanese whiskeys. I know there's a lot of shenanigans going on in Japan as well regarding the whiskeys, and I'm going to do a whole video on that. We'll save that for discussion for another time. Um, but there are certain traits and characteristics that might sort of typify a Japanese, classic Japanese style. The Nika from the barrel, which made my top 10 for 2018, is probably like the best example of that that I know of. Anyway. So my question regarding Legend, I know we've gotten off the track talking about Legend, is my question is, if you become really familiar with Japanese whiskeys, can you then try that and say, this particular trait reminds me of Japanese? That's the issue. So uh, Whiskey Thought it says, not really smoky at all, very unique and different. That's why I bought it. Interesting. So if you really, I, I use a lot of analogies between um, music and wine or music and whiskey. There are certain musicians that have a particular way of playing that even if they are, say, appearing in a song by someone else, some other band, if you hear them, you will recognize them. So, um, uh, Otmar Liebert is a sort of a jazz fusion guitarist. And I have some of his albums. And I was listening to one of his albums when I, when I just got it. And I'm listening to it. I didn't read the credits or anything like that. All of a sudden, I heard another guitar. And I thought, well, you know what? That guitar sounds like Carlos Santana. So you get the CD and you look at it. Sure enough, Carlos Santana is playing on Otmar Liebert's, in one of Otmar Liebert's songs. Um, the first time I heard Beat It, right, by Michael Jackson, Eddie Van Halen has a very distinctive style playing. So even I wasn't told or I hadn't heard that he was doing a song. Because you're not expecting Eddie Van Halen to show up on um, Michael Jackson, right? Because he's not a little boy. Sorry, I had to do that. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, but that style is so unique. So, in a similar fashion, the Japanese whiskeys, there's a trait to them that even if you aren't told it's Japanese, will stand out and say, this seems Japanese. Or Ingve Malmsteen. The whiskey throttle says Ingve Malmsteen as well. Uh, actually, Ingve's first name is spelled with a Y, I think, in the, at the beginning. Anyway. But okay, so but here's a so okay. There's another example, uh, um, Daniel. So Ingve Malmsteen, if you listen to Ingve Malmsteen, you can hear his influences. His influences are um, Vivaldi and Bach 
and Beethoven and especially Mozart. You can it's in the back. It's it's he's not playing one of their um, songs or tunes or whatever, but you can hear the influence and how it's affected his style of playing. Um, in a similar fashion, so it would someone who that's what I'm curious about. I know, way off track. Let's go on to point number two, but I'm gonna take another sip. If there's any bourbon in this bottle that's gonna get killed, yeah, whiskey thought is just classic trained exactly. Damn, that's good. Man, it's just it's good. This is dangerously good. You could you could just want to keep on. It's this is this is this is you could just keep on drinking anyway. All right. So there goes that one. I'm, I'm now I'm going to be moving on to this peated to the Balakin. All right. So the counter argument or the, the 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 response is the bourbon field now has an increasing number of finished bourbons that can offer more selection. And that's great as long as they don't lose their character. <laughs> These, uh, you need to try Murray Hill Reserve. You're, I think, the second person who recently bring that one up. Um, I, I will definitely make a note of it, and I'll go out and get it. He says, which is another Magnus... Oh, okay, another Magnus bottling, but not finished. Uses older whiskey blends, though. Okay, interesting. Alrighty. So, but... In terms of flavor range, still got to give it to whiskey, sc scotch, excuse me. Still got to give it to scotch. Okay, bing. Got to give the argument for scotch. Now let's talk about prices. Let's talk about prices. Oh, man. Okay, generally speaking, quality, generally speaking, you can get really good bourbons for far less than you can a scotch. Um, the Scotch Test Dummies just did a review of three Evan Williams bourbons that are like in the eight to twelve dollar range. Hey, Whiskey Crusaders, thank you very much for tuning in. Bourbon Knight says, "I have to go." Everyone, have a good night. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Greatly appreciate it. Um, <laughs> Amy says, "George is one of the store now. If you can order it and they can hold it for you, then you don't need to." My just by the way, by the way, so my local major chain store would not hold it for me but i was able to order one for chad from it's bourbon night and they held it for him but my local store wouldn't do it they only had like four or five bottles on the shelf so anyway but if you can buy one online and they'll hold it for you then you're good all right so price generally speaking um the bourbon has the advantage here big time while scotch has the advantage in terms of the range of flavors bourbon quality price ratio has the advantage and Scott and Bart just did a review of three Evan Williams bourbons, and I trust them and their palate and what they have to say about it. These were like eight to twelve dollars. There was a white label, black label, and a green label, and I think the white one is bottled in bond, uh, which means it has to be at least fifty ABV. And I don't remember what the scores were, but they were all saying how good those bourbons were for the dollar, and I think a couple of them at least went through the Lincoln County process in terms of charcoal filtering or something similar to it. Um, you cannot, you can't find a scotch that is of high quality under $30. If anyone here can name me one, okay, okay, let me take it back. Uh, Johnny Walker, Johnny Walker Black, you might be able to find for 26. To my knowledge, Maybe the, maybe that's probably about as low as you can get. But what tax is going to take over 30 That Johnny Walker Red is $16, $17, and there's no way in hell you can put anything up against that one uh, in, in the bourbon world. You just, you just don't even want to go there. Scotts can't touch bourbon. Tomatin 12 can be under 30 Sherry finished and good. Tomatin 12. Okay, there's a good challenge. Tomatin 12. And then uh, Ruslov Trap said that as well. I'm gonna take your word for it, and I mean, I'm, this is this is why this is why I love the chat. Okay, can be under thirty. Sherry finished and good. I will I, I will make I'm gonna look this up afterwards. I'm not gonna do it right now, and then see if I can get one, and then I'll I'll take up the challenge as a potential 
um, high quality price ratio scotch. But again, these are generalities, right? There's always exceptions to the rule with everything, right? Generally speaking, bourbon has the advantage. And I think for the average American consumer, and particularly I would say for our bourbon friends who do either exclusively or 90% plus of bourbons, that's a major factor. Um, when I've talked to Bill, the whiskey dick, that's one of the reasons why he does so much bourbon because, because they're so affordable. You know, I, for example, those 20 bourbons, with exception of this one, because I bought this one later, that I reviewed, the total, I paid under $500 for all those bourbons collectively. Under $500. $500 with scotch might get you half of that. Maybe. Maybe. So I can get twice as He says once you get about 50 bucks, I think scotch is better or, or as good. Under 50, bourbon has more choices that are uh, are good. Date Silve, Dustin, bingo. You hit it right on the head, right on the nose. That That's probably the best way to sum it up. Uh, cheers to you, sir. That's probably the best way to sum it up. So, um, and, all right, so price. So we're going to give it to, and for the person who, you know, the college student or just the, you know, if you're married and you got kids and you got to pay for diapers and everything else you got to pay for, it's hard to spend the money to dish out the Delta cash for a bottle of scotch when you get a high quality bourbon for under 50 bucks. But scotch, I'm just gonna be the bourbon world may be blowing this one. I've mentioned it a number of times in my videos. There's a lot of bourbon prices. They want to be seen a little bit more as chic. They want to be a little bit more because classy. They want to kind of get be viewed in the probably in the in the in as being equivalent or as good as classy or classic as scotch. And so they're pricing themselves accordingly. And and I'm not just talking about the Jackie Van Impey. Not Jackie Van Impey. Jack, Pappy Van Winkle. Jack Van Impey is a televangelist with big giant hair. Who's, anyway, never mind. Um, but the prices are creeping. The prices are creeping. Um, and the, But the prices are creeping up in scotch too. There's been a number of chat going on about, about say, like Bal Blair that there's been a number of different brands who are rebranding themselves, new bottles, new labels, and jacking up their prices. The scotch market is going up, increasingly going up. I want to do a whole video on the cause and effect of uh, whiskey locks or whiskey lakes. I'm actually just, it's part of my current studying for my class in Edinburgh. Um, the, there's two major time periods in which they had a bourbon lake and there was a bust and they ended up closing distilleries. And the question is, are we heading for another one? Are we heading for another one? Are they repeating history? If you don't know your history, you tend to repeat it. Are they repeating history? But I'll do a whole video just on that topic. All right, let's take a little sip of the Belekin. Mm. Damn, that's good. So delicious. Whiskey Lotus says, damn you. I'm going to go pour Elijah Craig 12 now. <laughs> so Elijah Craig 12 turned to bottle it as 12 or difficult to get a hold of, but Daniel has a few. Um, they pay to import. I'm not sure what you're referring to, what the, who the they is. I don't know what the antecedent is to the third person uh, plural or pronoun is. Sorry. Anyway. <laughs> So, um, integrity, authenticity, integrity and authenticity, integrity and authenticity. By this, I don't mean the illegal stuff that some distillers have done. If you read Bourbon Justice, the bourbon category, bourbon producers have a long history of doing shenanigans. You study Scotch history, there's a lot of Scotch distilleries who've done some shenanigans. You know, some BS stuff, right? Uh, Hep Hoyt says, have you tried Douglas and Todd bourbon whiskey? No, I haven't. You did, I mean, if you watch my channel, I do, I don't, bourbon month, I have probably tripled my exposure to bourbon month, uh, to bourbon, just in bourbon month. I, I don't have a lot of previous experience. Um, 
Uh, so Daniel's taking off. Whiskey Thought taking off. Thank you very much for tuning in. And uh, have a good jabron, jabroni evening. Uh, we're actually going a little, probably a little bit longer than I, I, I had hoped on. But anyway, we'll go on. All right, so integrity. Because there's stricter laws on bourbon, you, okay, they, um, because it has to be new, new oak, because you can't add caramel coloring, um, those are couple, uh, just, a, just a couple that give some integrity to a bourbon that stays true to its character. But there's a reason for that. They don't do that because they're such good people. No, because there was a whole lot of shenanigans going on in the bourbon world. And read Bourbon Justice. There's a, it's a long history of people selling stuff under the name of bourbon that had a whole lot of crap in it. This is why the, the category of bottled in bond came up. This is why T President Taft... Hey, thank you for... <laughs> Daniel gives me 99 cents Canadian. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Daniel. <laughs> anyway, um, this is why President Taft was the first person to really stick his foot down and, hey, we're going to legally define whiskey because there were other people putting all kinds of nasty-ass crap and still calling it whiskey. But if you want to know more about that, you need to read Bourbon Justice. All right. But, so, uh, Ralph... Ralphie, who was just on, if you guys haven't seen, there's a three-hour live stream that was recorded between um, uh, Aquavite and Ralphie. That was absolutely fantastic. I, mean, I watched, I loved the whole thing. It was, it, I mean, it, it, his, whiskey tuber history. If you haven't seen that, you got to go back and watch that. But Ralphie's been, he's been championing this issue of of age statements. I'm not as big an issue on, on the age statements as he is. But about the non-chill filtering, get rid of that. We don't need chill filtering. You know, people can deal with it, deal with it. You know, a little bit of cloudiness when they get their whiskey cold, they'll get over it, okay? Let's get rid of this nonsense. All right. Um, <laughs> uh, Lockness says, too much BS marketing from the distilleries. That's going on now. Um, the funny thing is, um, it's always, ex the BS marketing has been long time history in bourbon, and they call it poofery. Read again. Read Bourbon Justice by Brian Harrar. He talks. That's always been in the whiskey industry. That's why these channels are great for cutting through the BS and giving us some real info. I totally agree. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, all right. So, at least on paper, Bourbon has less shenanigans, less BS than Scotch. But it's not because of the goodness of the hearts. It's because of all the lawsuits and court cases, and the government stepping in. Let's get that straight. Hmm. I can't ever play poker anymore because everyone's going to know. If, if I got my cards, I mean, everyone's going to know. I, 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 I express, My whiskey reviews can be just with my face. All right. So the last issue is availability. Um, so scotch, in terms of variety, scotch wins. In terms of price, bourbon wins. In terms of integrity, bourbon wins. Availability. Availability. This is 100% dependent on where you live. Uh, the quig, food quig. Is been over in Scotland and in England, and I've been over there before. When you, the, one of the things it just shocks you. It shocks you. You go to your average bar, average whiskey shop, in even just in London. Not mentioned. You haven't even gone up to the Promised Land. You haven't gone to Scotland yet. You go holy. You look at this. You look. You're like. We can't get that. 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 We can't that. I've never heard of that. Never heard of that. Never heard of that. Never heard of that. Never. Heard of that. Never heard of that. You you just like holy cow. You realize probably in terms of the variety and the selection that's available. I don't know what the percentages are, but I would say less than ten percent ever makes it to the United States. That's how much, particularly independent bottlers. That's how much is over there that they can get. Okay, so. Now, of course, bourbons, if you reason, if, you know, the people in the UK and Europe are not going bonkers over bourbon because look what they got over there. They don't need to. They got some great scotches. Okay. And the prices are probably cheaper for scotch than what we're playing here in the United States. 
But availability here in the United States, and this is the one thing that really bothers me, <coughs> is the distribution and prices across the United States for bourbons is completely bonkers. And this is the result of sort of a, uh, the remnants of prohibition. Prohibition ended in uh, um, 1933, December 5th, 1933, but it didn't get rid of everything. There's still a lot of remnants that are still there. Slavery, okay? All right, okay. So Abraham Lincoln, you know, the um, Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation ended slavery, but it didn't get rid of all the remnants. There for decades, even a century, still remnants of the after facts of slavery still exist here in this in, in our country. And the same thing with prohibition. If I was running for president, well, I've actually seriously considered running for president for 2020. Um, <laughs> this would be one of my major major issues is to repeal the remnants of prohibition. D8 Self says, it's not just distribution, also demand. Uh, there are pockets of extreme demand per capita. True. But... If you, there's demand, what is availability as well? If so, you can't get something, you can't demand it. When you're looking at Tennessee, so, okay, so, for a perfect example. Um, so, I had Bourbon Blind on, and there is no total wine and more in Tennessee because they're not allowed to do online orders in Tennessee. You can't go online and order stuff in Tennessee because entire freaking... So the, so if you're a big chain or large provider of wines and spirits, why would you put a store in a place where people can't go online? Because I do 90% or more of my purchases online. I'm searching, what do they got? What do they got? And I'm comparing prices. Okay, they got this, they got that, they skip. And then I go online and I go and I order my whiskey. Maybe I have it shipped. Maybe I go pick it up or wines. And then I go pick it up. If I can't do that in Tennessee... That means the only way I can do things is go in there and look around and see what they got. And that sucks. That is a remnant of prohibition. And, and that the whole fly, I'm, I meant to do, a, I'm going to do a whole video on that, on, on, on the, that topic. It's super political, but one of these days I'll do that. All right. So those are sort of the main categories, pros and cons. Maybe, so someone else in, someone else in here, now, now here's the funny thing. Okay, Eric. If you give a, another pro to bourbon over scotch, what's your preference? This is the completely subjective aspect to it. Whiskey Crusader says, some states don't allow chains, and in Texas we cannot get whiskey shipped here. And that's bullshit. So pardon my, my French. Um, pardon my bovine scatology. All right. Subjectively, you can't say which one's better. What your preference is is what your preference is. If you prefer uh, Chicago-style pizza over New York-style pizza, then that's what you prefer, okay? So I, you can't make an argument that New York-style is better than Chicago-style, okay? Or Kansas City barbecue versus Texas barbecue or versus, you know, some other area of barbecue. You can't, you can't make those arguments because those are, those are a matter of preferences. Even though there's, I think, see the advantages of bourbon, I'm still a Scotchman. I'm still a Scotchman. Um, my preferences are still still for Scotch. They're still, I, I'm more for Scotch than for bourbon. But for me, I tend to, my approach and a take on bourbon is I'm in the mood. I'm in the, so sometimes, it's, it's, and that's, again, similar to music. I talked about music. Sometimes I'm feeling mellow and I, or I feel like hearing, I want to hear powerful vocals. When I want to hear powerful vocals, I'm listening to opera. I'm the tenors. I, I, what are you talking? Pavarotti, Placido Domingo, uh, UC Burling, Andrea Pocelli. They can't be beat. Except for Rob Halford with Judas Priest. I, I mean, and there's some... That guy's got powerful vocals. All right. But power guitars, you're going heavy metal. All right. Beauty and nuance and development of music. Um... I can also be in the mood for classical music. When I drive through the countryside, when I go out to the wine country, I love Vival I love Vivaldi's Four Seasons. Probably when I was lived in San Diego, I lived up in the hills, and I would come down from San Diego. I'd, I'd go to class when I was in seminary, 
and I drive through the San Pascal Valley and drive through the orchards, I will listen to Mozart every time. So I'm coming down winding roads and there's orchards of citrus and avocados. And I'm driving through down to the hills. I'm listening to Mozart. Okay. That's a completely subjective preference. And sometimes I'm just in the mood. And sometimes the same with bourbon. Sometimes I'm, I'm just in the mood for bourbon. But I would say one of the things that this month has really taught me is I have a d- different perspective and understanding and a great appreciation for bourbon than I did before. Um, and that's what's been so awesome for me this month. And my takeaway is I really have a better de- appreciation and understanding of bourbon. All right. So uh got about five to ten minutes left. I want to uh, do some giveaways. Hmm. Lockta says, I'm the same long troops. Not long trips. I'm loving classical music for sure. Yeah, four seasons. Dun 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 dun. Yeah. Anyway. The one music you can't listen to while driving, classical, you can't listen to the William Till Overture. You will get a speeding ticket. You listen to the William Till Overture and you will get a speeding ticket. Why? You gotta you just start driving faster. <laughs> you can't help it. I'm sorry, officer. I was listening to the William Till Overture. I, I just started driving faster, right? Oh yeah, the Brandenburg Concertos. So Hoyt says Brent, yeah. So I have um Christopher Parkening, classical guitarist. I have his recordings of the Brandenburg Concertos. Absolutely fantastic. All right. So I want to do some giveaways because we're wrapping it up. Um, so my philosophy on giveaways. Hi, hold silver. Oh, wait. <laughs> okay. So here's my philosophy on giveaways. So when you study YouTubing and how to grow a channel, there's a gazillion things you can do. Proving your thumbs, your titles, and all this kind of stuff. Um, there's different things you can do. The time of the day that you post. There's all these little things you can do. Um, to grow a channel. And there's some things you shouldn't do to grow a channel. Swapping, hey, you subscribe to mine, I'll subscribe to yours, is the worst thing you can do for a channel. But one of the things you can do for a channel for growth is do giveaways. People will subscribe if you're giving stuff away. People will watch if you're giving stuff away. The problem is, is once you stop giving stuff away, they quit watching. I don't want just subscribers. I want people who appreciate my content, people who enjoy joining. I, I, Terrence Scott, thank you very much for tuning in. Um, I love... Whiskey Ace, thank you very much for tuning in. I love the engagement. I love the people who comment. I love the people who join the chats. Th- that's subjectively what I get the most out of. Not the clicks on the uh, other subscribers, but the engagement and the interaction. That's what I love. Um, Whiskey Ace says, I don't think if you give anything. But I like giveaway. And the, fa- and the reality is, I, I got to move some inventory i gotta move some inventory so i generally this is just me and i'm not saying about anybody else i don't advertise giveaways i don't do a lot of giveaways one it's it's a pain in the ass to go to the post office and deal with packaging that's my biggest reason and two i don't want to give i don't want to give to get and and i we, i've had i've given stuff to people and they go hey i owe you one no you don't if i ever do you a favor whatever it is don't try to pay me back. Instead, pass that on. If I do you a favor, then the next time someone else is in need, you do that for them and pass it on. If I do something for you, expecting something in return, I haven't given you grace. I haven't given you a gift. I've made you a debtor. I've made, and now you owe me. And now I'm going to use you to get something from you. I don't like that. At, I, so anytime I've done something for someone and they say I owe you, I said, no, I don't pay me back. Instead, the next time you have the opportunity to help someone else, you do that. And you remember, yeah, someone helped me at a time. I'm going to help somebody else. That's the way I prefer it. All right. Yeah, pass it on. Exactly. Pass it on. All righty. So I'm going to do a giveaway. Um, I'm going to give someone a choice. Uh, basically, I can give you... Uh, you you can choose anything from the from the twenty that I reviewed, uh, and I'll send you a, I'll send you a sample. Um, 
I'm gonna, I'm, and I know there can be a technological glitch between what shows up here and when someone commented. So the only thing I can do is go by what shows up here. I'm sorry. And I know some people, Amy W, exactly, pay it forward. That's actually a philosophy in the sommelier world. That, 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 and that's one of the things I like about the sommelier world. That's very much, now not everybody follows it, but a lot of them do. And some of my best friends who are sommeliers, they just, they reek of that. They, they so much into pay it forward. Totally. Um, okay, so <coughs> I'm going to ask you a question. Um, and the first one I see come up, that's what I'm going to go with. And you're going to have a choice to choose a five ounce sample of any of the 20 that I um, don't deny. Uh, anyway, a 20 ounce sample of um, any of the top 20, any of the bourbons that I reviewed. You're gonna, any one of them, a five ounce sample. So five ounce, five ounce, ounce is about like this. What's the tobacco there? All right, um, I'm gonna make these pretty easy. Okay, what was my number five of my top five? What was the number five of the top five? Number five of the top five. Maker's Mark, he spelled it wrong. Captain, make it happen. You put prick, prick at select. I'm not counting for um, type eight typos. So Captain, make it happen. You got it right. It's private select. You hit a C rather than a V. <coughs> yes, Maker's Mark, private select. All righty. Um, so Captain, make it happen. Uh, send an email to uh, E-R-I-K-W-A-I-T. So my first and last name at yahoo.com. Send me an email Send me your address and I'll send it to you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna crickets chirping. I know that was a little weird. I, I thought that was pretty easy. Again, all I had to do was people were, were other people were watching <laughs> or paying attention, taking notes. Um, alrighty. So this is gonna be. So this is this is gonna be number two. I'm gonna give another one away. Um, yeah, worst time to have a brain fart. Exactly. Okay, here's another one. Um. This is number two for those. This all I'm doing is paint is testing you guys to see if you're paying attention, and see if you're previously watching. Sorry, I'm watching it after this. Yeah, sorry, Dustin, you missed it. Um, all righty. So here's question number two. Um, Chris Beaton, at how do you get coins? Send me an email, e r i k w a i t at yahoo.com, and I'll tell you you can get a coin. All right. Question number two. Um, again, you can choose any of the 20 that I reviewed during bourbon month. I'll, I'll send you a five ounce sample. All right. Question number two, what was the one whiskey that should have made my top five, but turned out being an actual a disappointment? What was that one? Should it could not be a disappointment, but should have made my top five. No, Elijah Craig Bear Proof made my top five. That was number two. Nope. Wow. No, it should have been a top five, but it wasn't. It was actually turned out to be a disappointment. Okay, so Whiskey Dong says turkey, but I reviewed more than one turkey. There you go, Thomas Buck. Wild Turkey Master's Keep. During Bourbon Month, I actually reviewed three turkeys. So Thomas Buck, uh, send me to, send an email to E-R-I-K-W-A-I-T at yahoo.com to send me an email, send me your address, and tell me which one you want. Any of the, any out of the 20, if you want, if you want a five ounce sample of this, I'll send you a five ounce, if you want a five ounce sample of Elijah Craig Bear Proof, anything you want, just, just let me know in the email and send me your mailing address and I'll get that out to you. Alrighty. So yeah, it was a Wild Turkey Masters Keep, $150, beautiful bottle, beautiful box, the flavors just didn't integrate, didn't come across as it should. Here is an example of a, of a sherry cast finished bourbon as it should be. If the a Wild Turkey revi a Revival Master's Keep was like this, I would have loved it. And it would have made my top five, if not number one. But the fact that I only paid $80 to $100 for this one, and that was $150. Bucks, and this is a beautiful bottle too. Alrighty. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, we're just at about, at about an hour. But an absolutely fantastic month. Tomorrow morning, I fly out to Texas. I might do a live stream from Texas. If so, I'll try to do it at my normal time. 
Um, may even meet Jason, uh, the mash and drum at, at down there. Maybe we'll do a live stream. I don't know. We don't have anything set. I'll be bringing back home a bunch of bourbons to shoot a bunch of photography, meeting some great people. Really, really looking forward to it. Of course, it'll take me a couple of weeks to do the editing and the video and put everything together, but we're going to turn May into Texas month. Hopefully make some good connections and bring out some great guests in May. The rest of April is going to be a study month for me. I just, I have to get my time in. I'll still do reviews, still do some uh, whiskey reviews, um, but it's going to be a study month. And so I'm going to do some heavily intense, I'm doing a whole study weekend. All right. Thank you very much for tuning in. I greatly appreciate it. Hey, I, I love you guys all. I, I love being part of this community. I love interacting with you all. This, you all doing this. And it's, if I had a thousand, if I had a thousand, you know, I've had 10,000 subscribers and there were 600 people watching and I couldn't interact the way I do, it would be a bummer. But anyway, we'd find another way to do it. We'd have to do Patreon separately. Uh, anyway, all right. Y'all have a good night. And uh, again, cheers.